Welcome to Chatting with Casey with your host, Casey Palmer. Episode 12. In a nutshell, what craft chocolate's all about. Welcome to Chatting with Casey, the podcast that's all about family, food, fashion, and faith, and travel, and tech, and knowing exactly where the stuff you buy comes from so you can make better decisions about what you buy. It's been almost a month since the Blistem Conference at Hotel X in Toronto, a three-day event that helped us build connections, get out of our comfort zones, and with luck, keep growing our brands so we can pay it forward to others. And so much has happened in that month. Jen Powell was gracious enough to hook me up with a business coach who's helping me realize options for my brand I likely never would have found on my own. The conference itself gave me insights that had me breaking through barriers and challenging myself with a new vigor. But one thing in particular that I'm happy to see happen from the new relationships I formed at Blistem is this chat with Richard Badra, a Montreal native who's looking to change the way we snack with Rebel Chocolates, the latest arm of his Rebel Food Company. Now, I'm not about to steal Richard's thunder with this intro, but it was more than just being a couple of the only men in a conference full of women that got Richard and I talking. The chocolate was no joke. I took some time to get to know Richard a bit and found his story fascinating. From the parallels of having a business and accounting background to being married with two kids all the way to wanting better for the world our children will inherit and our parenting styles, what came out of our paths crossing is a conversation touching on investing in quality, masculinity, and even some allegations of modern slavery. And it all started by trying a little chocolate. So without further ado, let's introduce the man of the hour, Richard Badra, and hear him tell it himself in Chatting with Casey, episode 12. In a nutshell, what craft chocolate's all about. I hope you enjoy it. Alright everyone, and uh, welcome to Chatting with Casey. By this time you've already heard the intro, so a welcome is a secondary welcome, but just go with it. You, you'll understand everything as you go through the podcast. Uh, we're here for uh, what I think is going to be a very fun discussion uh, with Richard or Richard Badra from uh, Rebel Chocolates over in Montreal. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. No, thanks for coming. Which one am I going with, Richard or Richard? Which one is? No, no, Richard's good. Richard, Richard. okay. You don't, also, I... don't forget, we're uh, there's still a, a, a community of Anglophones in uh, Montreal that's still surviving. So, Very true. Uh, and I've, I've, you know, I've been over a couple of times. I've been over actually a number of times. Um, my dad uh, owned a Saint Hubert chicken for many, many years. So I come over and I order in French off the menu, and I just like would get the death glare. So <laughs> I'll, I'll stick with the Anglophone side of it. That's what I know best. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. <laughs> um, so yeah, for everyone to have context, um, Richard and I met at this year's Blistem Conference over at Hotel X in Toronto. And well, we kind of connected for a few different reasons. One was being some of the only men in the room. Um, <laughs> I, we automatically gravitated to each other. Being dads of young children, we both have uh, a lot to discuss and figure out in that space. But Richard comes bearing a very interesting story and perspective as the you know the man of the brains and the brawn behind Rebel Chocolates, which uh, actually looks to provide high quality chocolates in a more ethical way and i'm not gonna steal your thunder man i'm just you know i'm just trying to make sure everyone knows why you're here and we we set up a few you know solid questions beforehand to kind of just set the tone so we're gonna go through a bunch of them and i think it's gonna be a great discussion cool so you ready man yes i'm ready looking forward to it all right so um let's start with question one what is the rigid badra story uh who are you where do you come from and what made you start rebel chocolates well, um, I'm born and raised in uh, Montreal from immigrant parents. My parents uh, moved here from uh, Egypt, and uh, and I grew up in a pretty uh, pretty boring, or not boring, maybe let's say uh, <laughs> that's not fair to my parents. Let's say <laughs> in a pretty conventional setting. So okay. uh, uh, nothing nothing happened in my childhood, so it was pretty normal, and then. Uh, and then continuing on that normal path, I decided to become an accountant, uh, a professional accountant. But I was never really happy with, uh, you know, being an accountant. I never thought I was doing any 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 positive 
uh, making or making the world a better place. Sorry to all the other accountants out there listening <laughs> to me. Uh, I did learn a lot of uh, a lot of skills, a lot of good skills that helped me to this day in my business. Uh, but I, I still felt like I needed more, something more. And um, so I founded a company. Uh, I called it the Rebel Food Company. And uh, the idea behind the Rebel Food Company was to rebel against uh, you know, big industry that I feel like have too much of, of um, a say in what we eat. Um, I mean, if you look at most of the food on the, in the market today, it's it's made up of, you know, a lot of big brands that are still there. They're losing slowly, slowly market share, but they still they still have their tentacles too much in our food chain. Mm-hmm. So Rebel Food Company, um, I decided to do something and I started Rebel Food Company. Now, uh, Rebel Chocolate is uh, the vision of Rebel Food Company. I decided to tackle the, the chocolate industry first uh, just because of it's one of the biggest industries in the world and it's you know one of the most uh, hypocr- uh, hypocritical industries as well. Uh, you know, we give chocolate for Valentine's Day, for birthdays, for a lot of events, mm-hmm. and we associate chocolate with being a happy thing. But behind chocolate, there's so much pain and suffering uh, people don't realize that to source chocolate, um, you know, there's a lot of people involved and some of these people are not being treated fairly. Um, you know, maybe we, uh, uh, maybe chocolate tastes good, but it's not, it's not good, you know, per se. The, uh, it, it tastes sweet, but the story behind it isn't always the case. No, 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 absolutely not. And, and, and 95% of the chocolate on the market today comes from cocoa beans that are sourced in uh, West Africa. And till this day, there's still allegations of uh, child labor and modern slavery. Um, and, and it's normal, like, the, the, you know, the cost of chocolate does not reflect, uh, it's, you know, the, the, the price of chocolate does not reflect its true cost. Because when, when the farmers don't get paid uh, for their uh, for their back bake, back breaking um, uh, jobs, you know the, the, the chocolate at the end of it is is really not fair, fairly priced. Well, that's that brings up a good point because there's in being in a you know in the developed world, if you will, or first world economy, however you want to call it, I believe that we're always looking for either you know a good sale, a good deal. Um, we see things from the end user economy. So we see that there's a, you know, chocolate on a shelf, toy on a shelf or whatnot, and we go and we put our money towards it. But what we rarely think about is everything that goes into it. Like a lot of um, conversations I've had with people lately about the environment, climate change, is if you really start to break things down and really think about the components of what goes into something. So let's say even like, you know, a bottle of pop, it's not necessarily the pop inside that's the killer when it comes down to markets, even though there are issues with sweeteners and sugars and the manufacturing processes behind them. But there's everything that goes into building that bottle. There's everything that goes into the shipping of that bottle and the gasoline used in order to actually transport it. And there's so many different factors that we don't consider as the end users of these items, but there's um, impacts all over the globe to all these things that we purchase. Absolutely, and I think we have to stop uh, using price as our as our final um, as our final deciding factor. You understand? There's uh, you know there's so much that goes into making our food. You know, and and, and price shouldn't be what 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 ultimately decides whether or not we should buy food. Um, it's it's to, our health is too important, and uh, like you mentioned, the environment as well. And the other, the other people that we don't see that are also involved in making that food and bringing that food to our plate. And uh, I think we should all start being a bit more conscious uh, about the decisions we make, uh, and not just with food, with everything you know, everything we, we do. You know, um, mind you, there's still going to be a lot of people out there that won't care for mm-hmm. you know, for Rebel Chocolates or Rebel Food Company's mission. But there are a lot of people out there that are just looking for something to cling on, some, uh, some, a mission. They can't maybe yeah. do it themselves, but we're giving them the means. I mean, again, Rebel Chocolates, what we do is we, we try to build awareness around something called craft chocolate, which is the complete opposite of everything I said about uh, the conventional or, or commercial chocolate that mm-hmm. we're used to eating. So uh, craft chocolate is a very ethical chocolate. 
And it's a chocolate made with uh, by artisan chocolate makers uh, who use some of the rarest and finest cocoa beans in the world. And they buy those beans directly from farmers and they pay prices higher than fair trade. Um, and they put a lot of care and passion into their craft. So ultimately, everyone wins. The farmer wins because they get better pay they and, and them and their communities live a better life. Um, and the the consumer at the end wins as well because they get this really good quality chocolate that has no additives, no preservatives, and is super natural and super healthy for them. So, I mean, I give it to my daughter. She's three years old and she only eats dark chocolate because I got her used to eating this type <laughs> of stuff and she loves it. You know what I mean? So, uh, and it's and it's also craft chocolate's good for the environment because right. these farmers they typically use sustainable methods of farming. And so, to me, I call it a feel-good chocolate, and it, and I'm just it just shocks me that nine nine out of ten people don't know about it. Um, and th- that's what Rebel Chocolates' mission is all about: is building awareness around it. So, again, it's not about selling chocolate; it's about using chocolate as a tool for positive change in the world. Mm-hmm. So, the more people buy craft chocolate, the better off everyone is: the environment, the farmers, and the consumers in the end. So, that's what Rebel Chocolate is all about. Now, can we talk a bit more about the craft chocolate process? Because, you know, there's, I'm like full disclosure to everybody. I've definitely tried out some of the chocolate that uh, Richard had at Blistom. There was a, specifically a flair to sell one, which is a salted chocolate, which was delicious. Um, yeah. But I think people really need to know what it is that sets it apart because, you know, there's, I always, I always try to um, educate people on the fact that you have these, in some cases, age-old recipes before we went into the entire commercial view of things and try to mass-produce things. There was a certain method and process to things. There's, you know, um, one of my favorite gummy candies is Haribo candies from Germany, which have been using, like, this process of deliciousness for ages. And you can get the same Haribo candy in North America, but it tastes different because we use different ingredients and different methods yeah. in order to make it work. So yeah. what, what makes Kraft Chocolate Kraft Chocolate? Well, it starts with a cocoa bean. Uh, just think of, uh, like, I guess this podcast is targeted to men. So maybe if I speak a language that they know, craft beer. <laughs> okay. Yep. Or, uh, you know, craft beer, for example. You know, I love craft beer. Uh, and as soon as you go to craft beer, you can't go back to the regular uh, 100%. Beer. You're entirely right. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? You taste the difference and it's, and it's, it's not, it's, and, you know, the, the craft beer makers, they don't add flavors necessarily. They, they use different ingredients, better, better quality ingredients. Mm-hmm. And these ingredients offer, offer a nice bouquet of notes, of flavor notes. Right. And that come, that come, and that, and that, and that, that and that, that's what determines their output, right? That the final beer it tastes delicious and complex. It's the same thing with chocolate. Uh, so it starts with the cocoa bean itself, which is like, again, it's one of some of the finest and more, most flavorful beans in the world. And then uh, it goes through a process of, they roast it. Mm-hmm. And uh, the roasting process is what really develops the flavor of the bean. And then they go through a, like a 10-step a process, uh, which includes cracking the bean and uh, uh, passing it through a grinder and uh, adding a bit of, of sugar and, you know, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a several step process that actually lasts, uh, depending on the chocolate maker, like it lasts several months wow. because they like to cure, the, to cure the chocolate to let it rest. And, um, and then the actual molding into uh, a chocolate bar. So um, it, it's it's quite um, it's, it's a fascinating process. Again, it's a multi-step process, and it, and and at any point in, in that process, if they if the maker screws up, well, it changes the whole taste mm-hmm. and the and the texture and the and the actual feel of the chocolate bar. So it's an art, and uh, it's a craft, and uh, and it's unlike anything I've ever tasted before. I discovered craft chocolate. Um, you know, you find so much, so many complex flavors in one bite, uh, and you freak out when you look at the ingredient mm. list, and there's two, two ingredients in there, cocoa bean and cane sugar. That's amazing. And you're like, wow, you know, like, where are all, you know, all those flavors, they come from the cocoa bean itself, so that's, that's in a nutshell what craft chocolate is all about. You know, and that's, um, in my eyes, that is a real testament to why it's so amazing i'm at a point in my life where you know i've 
done so many things when it comes down to experiences and buying different foods and, and purchases over life technology whatever and there's the entire idea of either you know buying it for life or understanding what the value is of what you're actually purchasing so craft chocolate by its very nature is going to cost a bit more but what happens is that you're actually investing not in the chocolate itself necessarily but you're investing in the hours it takes in order to put this chocolate together you're you're uh, investing in the expertise you're expect you're investing in the actual ingredients and their rarity of uh, the the valuation of that and I think that's where I'd want people's thinking to go where it's like you're understanding that it's you're making an investment not only in eating things that are healthier for you but also just more flavorful if you want to get a certain uh, flavor experience if you want to get you know access to certain ingredients uh, in chocolate form that you wouldn't normally find on a shelf in a store uh, that comes with a premium associated with it. Absolutely. And I mean, yes, it's more expensive, but I'd like to say that it's not that craft chocolate is more expensive, but it's just that commercial chocolate is too cheap. Ah, you yeah. So, you know what I mean? Like, again, it goes back to the ethical nature, or the unethical uh, sourcing of the cocoa beans uh, with the commercial chocolate, right? So it's normal when there's Someone in your food supply chain is not getting paid. It's normal that the you know the price at the end is cheap. Now, yes, craft chocolate is also more expensive because of the rarity of the beans, because of the process of making it is longer and is done with a lot more care. And not most of these chocolate makers, these small chocolate makers, they're they're small operations. You know, so um, it does cost them more to operate. But at the end, you get the result is you get this magnificent chocolate. And again, it's unlike anything that you've ever had before. I mean, mm-hmm. there's just one chocolate from um, Hummingbird, uh, one of the brands that I, I carry. Uh, actually, Hummingbird is a, a Canadian brand. Oh, so that's another that's another thing too. Like you know, Canada, we have one of the best kept secrets in the world. Is we have some of the best chocolate makers in the world. Um, and then we have Serene, which is out of uh, BC, uh, Hummingbird in Ontario. And we have Cantu uh, and uh, Palette de Bin, which are Quebec-based. And these are all uh, award-winning uh, chocolate brands. They've won awards at the international stage. Wow. Um, and they've been up against, like, uh, European brands who've been established there for, you know, like these houses of chocolate that have been there for hundreds of years. And of these course. Canadian brands actually go up against them, and they end up winning, uh, winning awards. So... Um, and is the whole point that I was trying to make was that, um, yeah, so Hummingbird makes uh, this one chocolate called the Copan, and it tastes like a, a piece of sweet bread, you, you, you know, like a, like a brioche, you know what I mean? And, and yet they have another chocolate that's made with a different type of bean that tastes, that has notes of apricot and uh, the dark cherry, and, and it's like, it's funny, if one maker uses different beans, and you have a completely different experience in the chocolate that you're eating, and it's it's, it's uh, I I think it's uh, it's a, it's like it's a pure pleasure, you know, when you're when you were able to taste so many different notes in in chocolate. That's you know that says a lot though. It's I was thinking of the uh, relation in my head of it being basically like going to a steakhouse versus getting a Big Mac. A Big Mac yeah. is nice sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you want a Big yeah. Mac every now and then. But you can, yeah. you know, once you've gone to a steakhouse, you understand the difference between, you know, the beef you get at a fast food joint versus something that has been, you know, let's say dry aged or marbled or, you know, is a certain cut or a certain grade, right? It, it gets into an entirely different level of uh, appreciation and understanding of what is now available to you in your, you know, flavor palette and profile. Exactly. I mean, we can use so many different parallels. You use steak, which is, you know, like you said, within the steak industry or market, the different steakhouses, they each make their steak differently and mm-hmm. they have different levels of, you know, of quality as well. So when you taste some of the uh, better steakhouses, it's hard to go back to the, to the to the regular ones that don't take care of their steaks as much, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, man. So... Okay, let's switch gears for a second. So, uh, you did mention your daughter. I believe she's three now. She's 
She's going on to four, Ooh. three and a half. Going on to four, yeah. So he's going for. Oh, we, I think at this age we're done counting in months. I think right now. <laughs> no, we're way past. Thirty-seven months. and a half months. No, she's yeah. Uh, don't she's even bother. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I uh, yeah. You're you're going from the three nager three nagers to the what the fours. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, um, I think mine is skipping uh, four, and she's going straight to sixteen. Honestly, right? Sometimes yeah, the yeah, things yeah. that come out of their mouths are amazing. I actually, just had uh, uh, the parent-teacher interview for my older son tonight at school, yeah, and yeah. he's you know to hear that he's had the same teacher for two years, and she describes him as just like a dream student. He's an amazing kid, and I know he's an amazing kid. I've I've been privy to the amazing side of him very many times, but. As parents and as having the home setting, you're privy to all the sides of your kid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, like, I, I know the side you're not seeing, but I'm happy that in school he at least is being awesome yeah. over there. I'll, yeah, deal, yeah, yeah. I'll deal with the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, that's part of being a parent. You know, we take job. the good with the bad. And, yeah. Uh, you know, that's the, that's the joy of being a parent. I mean, is my it? daughter, yesterday she was says something to her mom and I asked her oh, what did you say to her to your mom she says daddy I'm not talking to you <laughs> I'm like I look at her I'm like oh boy I'm not looking forward to uh, your teens <laughs> that sounds exactly right that, that's yeah, you yeah, know yeah. Um, how has the journey been for you so far and how has it changed you and your perspective on things oh man um, oh, we go deep over here man we go deep <laughs> yeah 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 I know and so it completely changed gears here yeah this is more uh Oh, I don't know. Like if I, if you permit the analogy, I feel like before you become a, a father, it's like you know you're going to work for the last twenty years using the same the same road. You're walking there. Sure. You know everyone on the road, the same routine. You know everything, and then one day you just stumble on, onto a cave filled with like an unlimited amount of treasure. Mm-hmm. You're like, wow, this has been on my path this whole time, and I just discovered it now. So, I mean, well. So being a being a father was just that, you know, like before being a father, you have your friends, you have your routine, you go to go to work and all that, and you live your life for yourself. Then you get you become a father, and then you discover this unlimited well of love that you never knew you had. And it doesn't matter if you're tired, if you're angry, if you're mm-hmm. happy. That love is just there, and it's constantly there. And if there's any, if there's one thing that's certain in my life is that the love that I have for my kids. There so that there's nothing nothing else in life is certain except for that. And um but with that amount of love also comes a huge amount of fear. Like I've mm-hmm. never been more afraid in my life than I am now. I guess more aware of my own mortality and and the mortality of my loved ones, my kids. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And constantly worried about them and what type of people they're gonna end up being or what type of people they're gonna end up being friends with. So you, you, there's just a amount of fear that it's just constantly there, and it's, it's, uh, you know, it's always in the back of your mind. No, it's very true. I mean, yeah. my my journey, you know, with having the two boys is, I know I'm I'm a lot more certain about certain things now. There's a lot of things I'm just, you know, don't know when it comes down to the future. But when it comes down to myself, and let's say, for example. Um, what I can take. There's certain challenges, you know, that don't matter as much anymore because I've been through things with the kids, or I know, you know, I, I can have a far more of a conviction about the things I do when it comes down to how I write and create things or the messages I try to put out because I have a self check of it. Where it's just like, you know, my kids will have unlimited access to the internet. Let's say ten years from now, what am I going to make sure I want them seeing? You know, ten years from yeah. now, and I, yeah. it, it's it grounds you a lot in a lot of ways to make sure that you have that filter, if you will, of just like I want to make sure that um, my kids can be proud of me, that I know I was able to put together the best effort I could to give them everything I can offer them as their father, and yeah. also just you know, it's it's the entire. I the big story that we often get these days is that the entire idea of fatherhood has changed a ton um, from when it was a generation or two ago, which I sometimes believe and sometimes don't. Like I feel like the the toolkit that dads had even thirty forty years ago is entirely different from what's available to them now. So it's always dads doing the best they can with what they have. 
that's yeah. been that's been history through through the entire dawn of humanity is like okay we're doing the best we can with what we have and now we have all these tools and gadgets and everything but also a world that wants us to spend more time with our children and so we do spend more time with our children than we would have before where it was just kind of like you know this separation of job versus home life and everything so i'm trying to take all that together and you know create this entire legacy and story for my kids where they can you know feel like i did my job <laughs> yeah, absolutely i think it's never been harder to be a father mm -hmm. um you're right in the past i mean in the past a generation before us our, our, our fathers for example was you know pretty clear-cut um you know it was simple to be a father back then the we knew that dad goes to work and uh, the mom either you know had a part-time job or was a stay-at-home mom and uh and she pretty much raised the kids you know the father was involved to a certain extent uh now it's we want to be more involved yeah and my, i mean my biggest fear is missing out on seeing my kids grow up like that concept is foreign to my dad you mm -hmm. know what i mean he he doesn't i don't think remembers like much from my childhood you understand so uh, and he doesn't care he's happy <laughs> like he environment doesn't mean anything so but to me it's uh and i'm sure to you too is like we want to be involved we want to be there but at the same time we still have that desire to accomplish something you know what i mean is that and uh, then my question is is that an impossible uh are we putting impossible pressure on our on our shoulder you know you know what i mean uh are we trying to do too much trying to be the perfect parent and trying to be an entrepreneur and trying to accomplish or entrepreneur or entrepreneur or you don't have to be a you can accomplish great things by being an employee as well you know it's not just for being an entrepreneur but uh you know what i mean so it's, it's tough being in that today yeah and um and uh we'll see i will see the next generation might be completely different too um well i think that's very that, true i think i think you know they have they have so many more tools and opportunities available to them that they we wouldn't have had at their age, right? Where yeah. the internet blew everything wide open. You have the uh, you have this entire view of what's possible or things you may want to be when you grow up. I know even right now, my kids having access to like audio video equipment or being able to just they can literally anything they imagine. I encourage them to figure out ways to make it into reality so that they can have a skill set, you know, as they go through school that they can rely on if they want to go down any certain paths. And yeah. you, 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 you and I would probably know this very well. Um, I went to business school and was, um, when I started working my day job, it was in a business, uh, finance and stats stream. Yeah. So like yeah. the entire accounting where I had to do my managerial, financial and general accounting and everything. And my, parents were hoping I'd become an actuary or go down the charter accountant path and I was like yeah that's not happening <laughs> but there's, there's used to be like you know especially with immigrant parents it's like you were going to be one of like yeah. these four or five different kinds of jobs and yeah me it was one it was an engineer there you go oh boy I, my, I my learned to rebel very early on yeah we were just like you know that was just that was our parents ways of making sure we'd be okay right yeah. of making sure we'd be able to be successful and figure ourselves out and now we're in a world where the entire definition of success has changed so much and it looks so different from what it was back then yeah um absolutely and uh i know now i feel like as well i guess our parents define success as going to school and graduating and making mm -hmm. money us we define success differently mm -hmm. we understand uh is being happy i think yeah. we want to be happy with what we do um and but my question is also well how does that reflect on our kids i'm, I'm scared for the next generation mm -hmm. understand we still have that old school old, old mentality of work mm -hmm. work where you want to accomplish time. something like you still have to work towards it where our kids i feel like they get things a lot too easy and that scares me. And everything is a lot imper more impersonal thanks to technology. Yep. People uh, think we're losing touch with reality, mm -hmm. and um, and it scares me. What type of what type of uh, humans we're putting out there in the world? You understand? So, well, it's true. Yeah, they're making them less resilient, right? It's it's. Yeah. Do they, will they have the? I guess the armor, the backbone, if you will, to be able to deal with the hard things that life is going to toss at them. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, I guess we have to do the best we can as parents, but then again, we can't rely on other parents as well, right? We have to kind of hope that their friends are also, you know, I'm trying not to, 
trying to you know not give a cell phone to my to my daughter or right. not have her play with one or even my son. I have a fourteen year old, a fourteen mm-hmm. month old son, mm-hmm. and he's already you know he already grabs a cell phone and he already knows how to switch from picture to picture mm-hmm. and swipe on down the screen. Yep. Like, oh, that's where they should learn to do that, you know? It's, a, and, it's this weird, you know, generational learned thing where they just yeah. like figure out, oh, you swipe. This is what you do. Yeah. Uh, and and I'm, I'm trying to push that as far, like trying to push that away from as far as I can right now. It's just to try to keep them in touch with uh, their, you know, they're a part of the brain that they need, their imagination. You know what I mean, and and that's something that scares me too. Is that is we're being we're re-engineering our brains to rely less on our imagination mm-hmm. and more, and and we're outsourcing that imagination to computers in a sense. So now we're, we're automating our brains, and um, and so. But again, like, are they going to be disadvantaged because I wasn't? We're not, we're not pushing technology too much on them now when they go to school. Uh, Will they, will they be disadvantaged compared to other kids who their parents were more liberal when it came to technology? Um, you know, there's a, it's a, these are very philosophical questions. Obviously, <laughs> we're not here to we're not here to solve uh, to solve these these issues. But uh, I think it, uh, I'm glad that we're able to have a platform where we can discuss this, and uh, you know, and hopefully other fathers and uh, parents in general can listen in. And then maybe offer solutions. You know? For sure. I mean, don't worry. This is a thinking people's podcast. We want everyone to feel that they have uh, gotten value from spending the time here, whether it's uh, in laughs or thinking about the world they're in and the choices they make and things of that nature. So we're completely on track. Everything's good. Right. good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know what? Um, there's a there's a good point there in that. Um, I'm going to loop back to something which I think you are pretty passionate about yourself Um, with environment and climate change and talking about, you know, how much longer can we sustain our world at the way we're consuming things right now? I've been, you know, challenged by a friend from high school to uh, be a bit more conscientious about it. He actually has a site where he has a, um, climate change pledge and what it is is an actual kind of scorecard that you can print off or you know not print off if you want to be more environmentally sound i just understood the irony in that as i said it anyway um, but you know it has it has little it goes from um small tasks to large tasks that you can do i think in about six or seven different categories in order to you know be better when it comes down to uh being stewards of the resources of the world around us and yeah. I'm just kind of wondering, you know, where do you stand on that? What are you doing in order to uh, help make a better world for all of us? Because I know, like, you you and I alike are seeing our kids grow up and you want them to have long and thriving futures ahead of them. But how do we do that when the world is kind of crumbling around them? <laughs> well, it's, um, it's a tough question because you're right. When you actually take a moment and think about, you know, where we're going in terms of uh, you know, the environment and, and climate change, it is pretty gloomy. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think a lot of people do on purpose to not uh, think about it. Or, or when uh, they're reading the paper or in the morning, uh, the digital paper, right? Because you won't read the, of course, of the course, newspaper, right? The digital <laughs> paper, right? Just skip those stories that talk about climate change. And I know sometimes I do, just because I don't feel like getting depressed. Um, I think it's just trying to find a normal life to live, and but then again, we're ignoring the the main issue because I, I, you know, chocolate is one thing, right? I can convince people to to abandon uh, commercial chocolate by telling them why it's so unethical and and the crap that goes into making it and and all that, and to switch to craft chocolate, which is so much better for the you know the reasons we discussed earlier. That's easy. That's an easy switch for them, mm-hmm. but. Than to tell people to completely change their lives to, you know, stop driving a car or buy an electrical car. Not everyone right. can buy an electrical car, right? right? Or convert your house to solar. You know, it, it, these are, you know, uh, it, they're very uh, intangible things. You know, right. and, it, and people won't see the the results right away. I, I, I don't know. It's, I feel like it's a conversation that's important to have, but at the same time, it's uh, it's. Uh, 
it's gloomy and it's, it's depressing to talk about it just because we feel so help. I feel helpless. I mean, what I do in my everyday is, well, when I ship my chocolates to my wholesalers and all that, um, my wholesale clients, I try not to use too many packaging. You mm-hmm. understand? I try to use biodegradable uh, little peanuts that I put in a box that I know they're they biodegrade. Or if I'm packaging my uh, my drinking chocolate, because I have a hot chocolate that I that I sell, I package it in a biodegradable bag. You know, for instance, that's you know, little things like that that I feel like make some type some type of difference. You know, again, but but then again, I'm I'm mailing my subscription boxes. I'm you know, there's a truck that comes and there's a guy that comes and puts my my subscription box in the truck that drives away and that uses he emits. Uh, uh, CO2 and you know so I'm like yeah, you I'm still perpetuating have I still have a footprint and, yeah. uh, but uh, you know it's something that I'm constantly I have my eye on and uh, the bigger I become the more I'll be able to have the funds or the time to really think about it, every single action that I do and the consequence that it has you understand so um, it's tough man I think it's, <laughs> it's really a tough question Fair enough. I'm I'm gonna move away from the gloomy content, and we can move to something lighter, so that we don't you know put all get you know I don't want to have a ton of audience members who are all depressed by listening to the podcast. So, um, <laughs> so move to chocolate. something a little better. <laughs> yeah, have some chocolate right now, guys. You know, we order, go to the Rebel Chocolates, order some chocolate. It's gonna be delicious. It's gonna help you feel so much better after listening to this. Um, so here's a question for you. So, the the typical man, I wouldn't imagine that most men are you know huge chocolate. Uh, consumers in general they usually it usually ends up in a valentine's day package or it usually goes to significant others or mothers or what have you but i don't really think that most men associate chocolate with masculinity do you think there's a way we can you know flip the switch on that and get more men to buy into chocolate Man, it's it's crazy that he mentioned that because it's so true. Like, you know how many times I sample chocolates at at, uh, at festivals or at uh, I go to markets and I just I'm there sampling chocolate. Nine times out of ten, when I'll have a couple come up to my booth, the woman will be so super happy and excited to try the chocolate. She's like, oh, honey, look, there's chocolate, and the man will be like five steps behind there, pretending like he didn't hear. <laughs> like it's and, poison. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like uh, no, I can't be associated with it, and it makes me laugh every single time. But you know what? Most of the time, the man finally ends up coming and trying the chocolates, and he ends up buying more than the woman. <laughs> so uh, awesome. it's a it's a losing battle, guys. You know what I mean? Just open up <laughs> to your uh, to your chocolate side. You know, it's um I, I think you know it's a, again there's it, this this chocolate is and especially craft chocolate it, it's for it, it's catered to whoever likes. Mm-hmm authentic things whoever likes to try and explore uh things that they've never explored before it sounds a bit sexual and not <laughs> <laughs> well and this going to be an aphrodisiac uh, i mean let's be let's be uh, honest here <laughs> i'm talking about food here okay, so uh you know uh, again would you have known that uh, craft beer was so good if you didn't try craft beer right, right. Uh, or would you have known that wine was good if you st- if you st- if you just if you stick with uh, house wine, it's the same thing with chocolate. It's uh, I mean I'm a man and I'm, I I decided to dedicate my life to chocolate um, just because I I love let's say coffee I love specialty coffee like mm. third wave coffee you know I like the complexity of the flavor so I had once I had a bite of uh, craft chocolate and right away I'm like wow this is amazing and uh, I think just uh, you should just realize that there are better there are really better things out there and then uh, to explore and to discover and chocolate's one of them you know when it's eaten eaten correctly it's really good you know? here's a question actually i just it just popped into my mind right now how does your daughter deal with halloween <laughs> <laughs> well, halloween is uh i, I think uh will uh it will still uh be halloween with the candies and uh, i don't know if craft chocolate will ever be a uh, part of halloween of course so, yeah. But yeah. like, does she does she actually like enjoy the chocolate she gets from Halloween, or does she do something oh, else my with God, it? Sorry, I completely misunderstood your question there. Sorry, Jason. Uh, she yeah, she a kid's a kid. You know what I mean? Like uh, she still has her uh, chocolate bars, and okay, the, uh, or her lollipops, and I don't know she still likes uh, okay. her Halloween candy. Can't take that away from her. No, I, mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't ask you to do that. Well, that would be madness. Like you don't want to be that dad. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> 
No, no, you scar kids for everything. Take their Halloween candy away. Right? You get it. No, kids still have I to mean, be kids. You, you, you know, they the world wants them to grow up way too quickly. So you want to hold on to that childhood as long as you can to make sure that they can enjoy <laughs> themselves. So absolutely, yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, I, I won't lie. I'm not an angel. I, I sometimes I'll go put my hand in her, uh, in her candy bag, and I'll, uh, and I'll, have, I'll take a few of the candy bars. Why not? Don't worry, I'm only judging you a little, not a lot. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! So, what do you get up to in your, you know, non-existent free time when you're not trying to manage a business or parent your kids or take or be on, you know, podcasts with near strangers who, you know, somehow convince <laughs> you to do it? <laughs> Today, that's pretty much that pretty much sums <laughs> up my life. <laughs> Like, wow, I'm de- I'm depressed now. Forget the environment, man. I have no life anymore. <laughs> well, that happens. As a, that can happen as a parent yeah. for sure. Yeah, and I feel bad because I'm married and I love my wife and I don't give her nearly enough attention. You know what I mean? Uh, she deserves a lot more, and you know she's being super supportive too, mm-hmm. and she gives me my space. And and uh, but yeah, I mean, I back in the days I used to like watching like anyone else, like watching movies or series on netflix and all mm-hmm. that but uh not much time from that anymore unfortunately yeah right i mean i uh yeah. the only reason why i get to watch some netflix and whatnot is because i usually have a second monitor open while i'm working on all the business <laughs> the stuff on my other computer so i'm always just kind of yeah. like i i'll miss half of what's going on and get back to it. i'm like oh right yeah this happened <laughs> yeah it's um i mean i already have a hard time juggling between being a father and, and an entrepreneur i'm always constantly giving time away from one to put together so you know to add more i then it's you know it's for now it's in balance it's not a balanced life i'm the first one to admit that uh but i'm doing this so eventually i could reach a certain balance where i'm happy you know there's time for where sure i'm doing something that i love and at the same time i have the time uh, to be with my kids whenever i want to be with my kids right if i want to take uh, two months off in the summertime and to go on vacation i want to have that you know freedom to do so mm-hmm. so that's, that's why what i'm doing that's why i'm doing what i'm doing not for the money because i didn't pick the right uh, industry craft chocolate is such a niche product uh, industry for now there's there's not it's not being a starting a tech uh, or a fintech company where i'm i can make a million dollars in a, in a couple of minutes right uh it's it's a it's an industry where i have to work hard uh, but as far as I know, I'm, I'm, you know, one of the only ones that does what I, what I do. You know what I mean? That 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 supports craft chocolate. To, you know, to the point where I started a brand that supports it. I mean, that's why I call myself a uh, craft chocolate uh, champion. Mm-hmm. You understand? So for sure. Uh, I mean, I don't make chocolate myself. Um, I, I just try to bring the best the world has to offer, and especially Canada, and to try to, you know, build awareness around this wonderful product and and hopefully convert more than a few to a cause well it's you know, worth it for sure yeah for sure i mean the, you bring up something that's very near and dear to my heart and that um time time is the most non-renewable resource and we need to find ways to make sure that we are using what time we do have as best as we possibly can um so whether that is you know spending time with your kids whether it's a lot of short-term pain so you have the long-term gain of being able to be around and give them the experiences you want to give to your family and things of that nature uh i feel like time needs to be at the front of our minds and not money because money you can you know it's it's i don't want to oversimplify it so you can always earn more money but you get more money you can get more money per hour you know whether it's a promotion or you know realigning how you do your business model things like that but you can't get more time time will go and it is gone exactly it's uh it's the it's the most um it's it's our most valuable resource and um and yes i'm i don't know about you but i'm constantly faced with that uh, with fear of missing out on time mm-hmm. or running out of time. And, uh, and, you know, I guess it's, it's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing, uh, because we're constantly stressed. We're constantly, oh, I'm wasting my time. <laughs> oh, heck yeah. I don't have time or I'm wasting my time or there's no time. My time, 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 time. And we don't appreciate the present. And sometimes I think it's important that we take a, a few steps back and say, okay, this is where I am today and I have to enjoy it and I have to stop looking 
at the at the future and saying, "Oh, the future is going to be great. The yep. future is what I'm working towards." But no, but look at today. Still Open your eyes today. today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you're because you know my kids today or your and your kids today will only be at this age today. Exactly. Tomorrow mm-hmm. they'll be old and they won't care about you. Yep. I mean, they won't care. They won't want to uh, you to hold their hand. You understand or or to, uh, to wipe their bum when they finish pooping. <laughs> you understand? Unfortunately, it's true though. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I mean, yeah. I, I wrote a piece uh, a while back that said, if you're hustling till you drop, something's got to stop. And we yeah. focus so much on just like, you know, trying, like you said, we work for the future instead of living in the now. And yeah, yeah it's balance, man. Balance is so important and it's so key. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, life. Life is gone in a heartbeat. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So you just have to, just have to enjoy the now. And you always have to have an objective and ambition and, 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 but, but never, never at the expense of, of your loved ones. Of never, you know, that's, that's key. Cause no matter what money comes, money goes, but, uh, but your love being like surrounded with your loved ones, that's, that's what's most precious in life. You know, having friends, uh, having family and, and just enjoying good moments with them. That, that's, that's what life is all about. You know, for sure, man. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to, uh, let's, let's wrap this up by taking it back to present day. So, um, this will be, you know, people are going to be hearing this on, uh, November the 19th. I'm moving a few things around the schedule to make sure this is timely because November 20th, I believe we have the rebel giving Twitter party. Yes. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Um, I had to catch everyone up on what's up. Um, there was a, I guess, Shark Tank style, like incubator thing at Blistem where uh, Urchard and a few other business owners got to present their idea and get it voted on by a panel to see who would be able to get a bit of a social media push from the Blistem crew. And uh, Richard took it. He won. Yeah, I did. Um, I don't think I had the best pitch. I think (laughs) I just, I I think I I spoke from the heart, like like I've been doing throughout the interview, our interview together. Um, yeah, it's, I think I didn't even have, a, to be honest with you, I didn't even have a speech written. Um, I, I just winged it there on the spot. And, uh, and when you trust your heart, it never fails you. That's exactly and, it. Uh, and I think that's what people got hooked to. And, and, and I've spoken to more than a few, few of the attendees there and they, they all told me they voted for me. So I'm blessed that they did, that they saw something in me. And, um, now I have to follow through. So of course. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, so basically the, the award, the prize from that that pitch was a a Twitter party. Uh, now don't ask me what a Twitter party. Is. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. It sounded cool on the spot. I'm like, yes, I'm going to a party. Nice, <laughs> nice. I didn't even have a Twitter account. I have one now. Good. Um, and just uh, trying to get as many uh, followers as I can before then. And and uh, yeah, I'll be launching some exciting products then. Um, so whoever's listening, you know, I'm, you might not like chocolate, but I know your, your, your loved one does. So, Hey, get them a subscription plan for Christmas. There you go. They love you forever. There you go. <laughs> well, I'll be, I'll be supporting. I'll yeah. be, you know, I have about, um, you know, near 8,000 followers on Twitter. So I'll be sending out the word about the rebel giving party on Monday with the podcast so that everyone knows about it and goes out to support. And if, you know, Sarah, I don't know if Sarah actually listens to my podcast, but, you know, if she ends up with a subscription under a tree, then, you know, that's just how it's going to go. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great, man. Uh, you know, this, this type of chocolate is, uh, everyone loves it. Uh, my success rate has been 98%. I mean, everyone that's tried the chocolate has bought it because they, they just loved it. And you can't go wrong. Really, like, you can't go wrong uh, with giving a box of chocolates to, uh, or a craft chocolate to your loved one. Uh, they love you and they, they appreciate it for sure. Yeah, man. No, I I mean, I only try to promote things I either believe in or I think that um, others would find value in. And as someone who stood there at your table um, at Blistem and got to try it all firsthand, I don't really like chocolate off that much myself, honestly. I'm more of a savory type and I usually go more yeah. towards, uh, let's say, chips fries you know other saltier snacks but when i tried the chocolate i was just like this this could turn the tide <laughs> this yeah, could be yeah, the yeah, thing that changed it for me yeah no for sure man 
And you know who else liked my chocolate at Blistem? I don't know if you're there uh, till the end. Adrian you know, Grenier, uh, man. Yeah, Adrian Grenier, <laughs> aka uh, Vinny Chase from Entourage. He actually like walked right by my booth, and I I don't know where I got the guts from, but uh, I just grabbed him and I'm like, hey man, come here, Adrian, try some chocolate. He's like, is it dark chocolate? I'm like, yeah, it's dark chocolate. And here, try it. He took a bar, we took a picture, and he left. And I'm like, wow, I was like super excited. <laughs> and um, I actually reached out to him on um, on Instagram. I sent him a, a message and you know what? He answered me back. He answered awesome. me back and he, oh man, like, and he has like something like 700,000 followers. And I'm sure he gets like a thousand messages a day. Of course. And he actually answered me back and he's like, uh, dude, it was so good to chocolate. Where can I get some more? I'm like, hey, I'll send you a box for free every month if you advertise for me. He's like, yeah, man, I'll do it. Yo. So, yeah, so I like, keep my fingers crossed. But, uh, hopefully, I got an ambassador in Adrian Grenier. So, man, why uh, even show up on my podcast? Seriously. <laughs> 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 well, let me get invited to a few of his parties. For and, sure. Uh, and then I'll put in a good word for you. Hey, man, it's like I was saying with... Uh, I don't know. I was talking with another buddy about something about how he had a he was doing uh, something on a train, like he had a train dinner escape, like puzzle party type thing, and people were signing up for it without even knowing what it was because it was just so good and at a good price that it just sold out without having have to, without having to actually promote it. And I'm a really yeah. really big believer in the fact that when you have a really good product, you know, people will find out about it and it will do well. So there you go. You're you're living it out, man. You're living it out in a good way. And I think that the more people who get to know about Rebel Chocolates and get to know what you have to offer and why it's important, it'll spread. Just keep at it, man. You're doing a good stuff. You're doing Thank a good you. thing for us. Thank you, man. I, I hope so. I hope I'm not sacrificing all this time and, uh, uh, you know, for nothing. And I, th- I don't think I am. I think I'm... Um, like I said, I'm following my heart. I'm doing this for social reasons, for for the good of humanity, and uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, I end up being right at the end. Yeah, for sure. So, is there anything burning you want to share with everyone before we wrap things up? We have already, I've almost taken up an hour of your time, so I want to make sure that I, uh, you know, an respect hour the rest already? of your life. Oh man, that's how it goes on this podcast. No, <laughs> wow, I, I, I could stay another hour. I'm not sure your audience would like that, but uh, um, that's how you oh, get two man, episodes. I, 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 <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a two-part series. Stay tuned. What's Richard gonna say next? No, it's, uh, no honestly, it's. Uh, I think uh, we went through a lot. Um, got to talk about things that were not necessarily on your uh, on your list, but it's cool, man. I like this type of open conversation, and we discuss uh, life, we discuss uh, business, and I. This was a really 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 fun conversation for me and uh, hopefully i you invite me back in the future i'll be yeah, uh, i'll do this with open arms for sure i really appreciate that you know what i uh i'll be following rebel chocolates closely um there's i think there's a lot we can do to make sure that um we we do some features on the story and what's going on and that people are just aware of you know what you're doing and how you're doing it and why it's important um if we can continue to change the needle from people going towards what's cheapest versus what's best for them i think yeah. we just that's a that's a good goal in general absolutely and, and just to go quickly back to my example like we can't all buy a uh, tesla we can't all convert our our um you know our house to solar energy it's in the little actions that we do every day that make a difference right so uh, and again chocolate for example is switching from your commercial uh, chocolate uh, to a craft chocolate makes a difference because you're actually giving more resources to the chocolate maker, to the craft chocolate maker, to give back to the communities that, that, that take care of the beans, that harvest those beans. So, mm-hmm. so you know, the more craft chocolate we buy, the, the more positive uh, impact we're, we're, you know, we're doing to this world. And, uh, and these are little actions that, I, I'm sorry, it's not a big sacrifice, you know, you're switching from chocolate brand, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We can all do that. You know, and, and and feel good about it. You know what I mean. And that's that's a message I'm trying to convey to people. Get be, go beyond the price. You know, yes, it's a bit more expensive, but you live. Uh, but you the the experience you'll get out of it is unlike any any other food that you'll eat. For sure. Um, so that's it. Yeah, man. All right. Well, thanks for the time. 
Thank um, you. <laughs> I, I'm glad you enjoyed it. You know, it's always a good sign when it's an hour long conversation and no one realized it. I only have a, you know, because I have a record in front of me, I see the time going on. I'm always kind of like, OK, maybe I need to wrap it up here. But <laughs> uh, I'm glad that you didn't notice the hour. That's the best part. No, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> Hopefully your, your audience won't notice as well. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, they keep coming back, so that's a good sign. So I'm going to okay, go with good. it. <laughs> hopefully, I won't, I won't push them in your way. No, no, I'll, you think I'll you're good. I want to bring in. I want to bring in interesting conversation, so we'll be okay. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, that was Richard. I hope you guys had a good time listening to uh, the Rebel Chocolate Story. Do keep coming back. Um, I have a feeling Richard's going to be one of those guys that keeps showing up in my life because chocolate does not go out of style. If you look at the last several thousand years of human history so this story will continue and uh for now though make sure you go check it out look at the subscription box christmas is around the corner so make sure you get that going on and if you're on twitter rebel giving uh party tomorrow november 20th and if you miss it well boo for you i'm sorry you should have listened to this when it came out day one but it's okay because i'll send out tweets too i will find y'all all right guys have a good one and thanks for listening later That wraps up another episode of Chatting with Casey with our guest Richard Badra, who called in from Montreal. It's easy to talk about the change, but to be about the change the world needs, not only in the things we do, but in what we support with our purchasing power, takes a lot of gumption. And investing in ethical foods is a step in the right direction. It's easy to get jaded. It's easy to complain. But it takes a whole lot more to be part of the solution and make it easier for others to access the things that improve our world, even just a little bit at a time. But as for me, that's it. I'm done. Sarah and I are on the cusp of a nice couple of days away, but to get there, I need to get ahead of my schedule, so it's go time. A big thanks again to Richard Badra for the interview. Y'all make sure to check out Rebel Giving on Twitter on November 20th at 9 p.m. Eastern. And as always, if you like what you heard, do make sure to like, rate, share, and subscribe. It definitely means a lot. Thanks for stopping by, y'all. Have an amazing week, and we'll see you next time when we discuss fatherhood, reindeer, and why it's so important to keep creative. Till then, bye bye